Hello and welcome to SNI. I'm Ashwin Ahmed and I'm speaking to Ambassador Nencha Mukhopadhyay. Ambassador, I want to start first with you coming to Lebanon in 2005. What was your first experiences of the country? Lebanon had at that time just got into a massive uh, crisis because I arrived two weeks after the assassination of former Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri in a massive bomb blast in the heart of Beirut. So the whole country was in a tizzy. Every day there were uh, mass demonstrations in Martyr Square. It became known as the Cedar Revolution. Uh, thousands of Lebanese turning out, uh, demanding justice for Hariri and uh, demanding that uh, the Syrian troops withdraw. Syrian troops had been there for 30 years. And of course, uh, the general hypothesis then was that Syria was somewhere um, behind the assassination. So all this was going on and we arrived in the thick of this crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ambassador, now what was day-to-day uh, -day life like? Was Lebanon a safe place because of the tensions going on between it and Israel? Lebanon was um, a safe place and not a safe place, but certainly it was a place where you could live a full life and uh, a normal life. Um, the best way to, to live in Lebanon is to take your cue from uh, the local people. They've been through so much, you know, through decades of civil war. They have this sense of uh, almost an edgy kind of bravado that uh, they had to live life to the fullest, they live for that day. So in spite of all the turmoil around, there was always a way they found, you know, to live, to enjoy life. So we also learned from them. Mm -hmm. And me and my two children who were going to school there, uh, I think we were, I could say, uh, quite, uh, quite happy. Now, Ambassador, I want to come to the run up to the crisis when Israel started bombing Lebanon. Can mm -hmm. you take us through a little bit uh, before the few uh, few weeks and the run up to the crisis and when did you come to know that you know indian nationals needed to leave lebanon lebanon was already in crisis mode as i mentioned mm. but this uh, the war mm. the sudden on you know the sudden sort of bombardment that uh, came from uh, israel on the morning of uh, uh, 12 july 2006 was in a way unrelated to what was happening internally in lebanon uh, what happens is um, Hezbollah normally yeah. keeps a lookout for uh, um, to capture Israeli soldiers. You know, they, yes. they share the border in the south. Yes. And the idea is that um, they would use whoever they capture for um, exchange because there were lots of Hezbollah fighters in prison in Israel. So this is a game that they played uh, quite regularly. Uh, and normally these incidents are... Um, resolved locally with the intervention of UNIFIL, the UN peacekeeping force. So Hezbollah probably thought it was business as usual and that morning they chanced upon an Israeli uh, patrol uh, and in, they ambushed them. Eight Israeli soldiers were killed, two were captured. And uh, But somehow that morning the rules of the game had been changed by Israel, which of course Hezbollah was not aware of. So Israel decided to retaliate with overwhelming force and started bombing uh, Beirut uh, very soon after. And uh, so it was sudden in that sense. It was quite sudden. It was a sudden eruption. And by the second day, by early morning the second day, they had bombed out Beirut airport. They had bombed uh, not just South Lebanon, but parts of the city of Beirut itself. Mm -hmm and also the highway to, uh, to Damascus. Um, they had bombed out the main bridge. So, and then they also imposed naval blockade. So right. within 24 hours, Lebanon found itself completely trapped and sealed. Do, what did you see, I mean, on, as an eyewitness? I mean, were there dangerous roads? Did you see, I mean, uh, did you see um, people on the streets being uh, injured, etc. What, what was your eyewitness account? Uh, I, I didn't actually see people injured on the street because the bombings were very precise. Um, you know, the grade 
Israeli <laughs> precision. <laughs> they were bombing areas which they know are uh, the strongholds of basically Hezbollah and Hezbollah fighters. Right. So down south, a lot of the villages where um, who are you know families or sympathizers of right. Hezbollah were kind of bombed out, and in the city also there was a part of the city south South Beirut we call it mm -hmm. uh, that area was really bombed out, almost raised to the ground. But we saw from a distance and uh, uh, it was, but you know, missiles were flying um, over your head because all the firing was coming from the sea. The, you, you saw them, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. like Diwali sometimes. It was di like Diwali night, you know. <laughs> My God. Okay. And Ambassador, I want to ask you, now, at what point did you realize, because I mean, I'm sure communications were down that you know that there is a crisis regarding our Indian nationals mm -hmm. were you summoned to Delhi How, what was the plan in the sense to get them out um, no no question of being you know asked to go out of this uh, the, the scene of action as it were you had to be there uh, we actually the the situation developed over two three days we were watching very carefully uh, first of all we sent out word to Indian nationals through whatever mm -hmm. means that stay safe wherever you are and if you need uh, to evacuate, if you want to leave, get in touch with the embassy, these are our numbers. That was the message that we sent out. And uh, uh, then from Delhi, we also got instructions that uh, if the numbers are adequate, they would think of, um, you know, naval uh, evacuation. Um, and fortunately, what happened was that Indian Navy ships on a goodwill mission for Indian Navy ships were returning. In fact, the last port of call, ironically enough, was the port of Haifa in Israel. Yes. And they were turning back to India. They'd crossed the Suez Canal mm -hmm. when the trouble began. So the Ministry of External Affairs and Ministry of MOD uh, Defense, in coordination, uh, asked the ships to wait for instructions and you know just to remain there while when while was this man what uh, what day this was generally in that period maybe the second or third day of uh, of the crisis and so the first evacuation happened on the ninth day i remember right. the ninth day of uh, trouble breaking out right but um, the the problem was indian nationals in beirut were mostly semi-literate or illiterate um, yeah. workers who were spread out all over the country hmm. and many of them uh, were not in touch with us so we didn't we didn't have direct way of contacting them mm -hmm. so we um, activated you know the temples and the gurdwaras and uh, the social associations like there was a Kerala association Tamil association oh, okay so uh, we asked through them we sent word around Hmm. that um, we are there and hmm. if they need help, they should contact us. I think this was the first step. And then we found that the response was quite overwhelming. So many people wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think uh, on the third or fourth day, thousands of people just landed up at the embassy, embassy doorsteps with bag hmm. and baggage. Um, many of them in a state of panic, women and children included. Hmm. So our first main task was really to calm them down mm -hmm. and assure them that whoever wants to leave will be able to leave. But for now, you know, that's going to take a few days to organize. So we organized their stay in the Gurdwaras. The Gurdwara was a big, big help. Um, and they put them up, they fed them for two, three days. In the meantime, you know, Oh yes, the other big problem was documentation. Many of them are were illegal, um, or their work permits had expired. Mm -hmm. So different stages of um, legality or illegality. So to sort out their documents uh, was a big exercise. For that, you needed to also liaise mm -hmm. with the Lebanese authorities, who, in spite of the crisis and all that was happening to them, they were so helpful, the immigration authorities at the port, they mm -hmm. gave us all the help uh, required. Mm -hmm. And not only that, um, we managed to get free exit for our workers. Normally, there's a fine of $600 yep. or something if your papers 
are not in order, but they agreed to waive those fines, so the workers didn't have to pay a fine. Um, yeah. Uh, Ambassador, I want to ask you though, getting, I think, what, two, uh, approximately 2,000 Indian nationals, along with other nationals, I, I believe, mm. Sri Lankan, Nepali, ex and others. Now, th you had to take them from Lebanon, I believe, to Damascus and then to Cyprus, if I'm not wrong. Okay. Uh, so, my question is, A, because of the bombing, were the roads not dangerous? And number two, transporting so many nationals, that's a huge task along the roads. Yeah. How yeah. did you manage that, ma'am? Um, before the ship came into the picture, we were evacuating by road via Damascus. Yes. Um, and as I mentioned, the main road had been bombed. So we yes. had to find other uh, ways to evacuate people. But those were, you know, by road and by bus, you can't really do large scale evacuation. But b the presence of the ships made it possible for us to contemplate a larger scale uh, evacuation. And the ships didn't have to go to Damascus. The, the, what happened was um, the ships would dock at the, on the international waters just outside Lebanese waters because mm -hmm. the blockade you know, mm -hmm. was from all the Lebanese waters. And they were about four hours away from Beirut. Mm -hmm. And so they would come to Beirut um, once we give them the green signal. Right. Um, then we would load the passengers and then they would go up to Cyprus, to Larnaca. Yes. By uh, ship. And that was an overnight uh, journey. Mm -hmm. And in Larnaca, they were picked up by Air India Boeing, uh, sorry, Air India Charter Flights. Right. Um, which was, uh, again, organized from Air India Dubai. Um, so, it was, uh, and then, not to forget, you know, they were, the ships, in order to come to the, uh, the, the war zone, they needed safe passage. Yes. So, absolutely. we had to coordinate with our embassy in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. to organize safe passage for our ships. So they would say, you know, from this time to this time, they can come and go. So the windows were not that uh, wide. So with, within that window, we had to do finish everything, you know, loading and uh, sending the ship out. Mm -hmm. So every day there was so much coordination to be done with, uh, with the ship, yes. with our mission, uh, with our um, uh, embassies in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Cyprus, Israel, uh, Damascus, um, then um, and with the Lebanese authorities uh, to regularize uh, the paperwork. Mm -hmm. So all that the mission had to, you know, all the coordination and sometimes decisions had to be taken on the spot because of what was uh, happening around. So all that was, uh, had to be done by the embassy. What, what were the some of the, you talked about decisions on the spot, what were some of the really yeah. challenging decisions that yeah. you had to make? Uh, basically things like, uh, you know, uh, depending on how many passengers we are able to clear, right. um, how many ships should come, mm -hmm. what, which date the ships should come, mm -hmm. which state um, the Air India flight should go to Larnaca, to which hub in India they should fly because right. we had established three hubs depend because the workers were from different areas hmm. uh, of the country. So the main hubs were Delhi, Bombay, Mumbai and Chennai. Right. So how many ships should come and when and how many flights uh, should come and to go to which destinations, all those were decisions that had to be taken uh, on the spot because we were the only ones who knew uh, you know, who were the passengers, how many were able to go. And you mentioned other nationals, yeah, we, we, uh, uh, we really, I think India uh, was really magnanimous in uh, spreading its protective and humanitarian mm -hmm. hand to our South Asian neighbors. There was lots of Sri Lankans, mm -hmm. um, in fact, their numbers are far bigger than ours. And there were Nepalese and Bhutanese, um, who, who also we, we helped. Basically, whoever needed our help, the, the modus operandi was their foreign officers would request headquarters yeah. in Delhi and then Delhi would advise us, okay, you take these nationals as well. So this is how we uh, helped the other uh, South Asian neighbors. And in, in fact, in one instance, we even sent a flight directly to Colombo. 
because okay. the numbers were so much. Mm -hmm. So we arranged for them to go by ship from uh, uh, Beirut to Larnaca and from there by Air India um, Boeing straight to Colombo. So ma'am, any families, any anecdotes you recall from that time? Anything that you know you can share with us that was particularly memorable? Uh, yeah, it was a very um, volatile uh, and insecure environment and anything could happen actually, but we were lucky. It was mm. plain luck that nothing bad happened. But I remember one instance, one Sri Lankan maid fell into the water while trying to board the ship. Okay. <laughs> Maybe she was nervous or whatever, slipped. Um, and uh, one uh, photographer, one foreign photographer took a picture, but we asked him not to use it and he kept his word. Yes. And another time, uh, one of the Indian Navy um, uh, um, the sailors were, you know, harnessing or tying the, uh, the ship to uh, right. the, this anchor. Um, the the rope whacked his leg and he broke a uh, he broke his leg and had to be taken to emergency operation. <laughs> so though, though, not so much anecdote, but those were incidents that I remember. And another thing that I always remember is the resilience of the Lebanese. You know, uh, there were moments when things were so bleak. Even though you're a foreigner, you really feel you know what's happening. Yeah. What 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 will happen to this country? You know. They were being bombarded, every village, uh, all their factories, roads, bridges, infrastructure had been destroyed. Ma'am, sorry, I just want to ask you, hmm. you were catering to so many people, coordinating so many things in a country that was being bombed. Were you at all uh, worried about your personal safety the sa because you're, and the ones of your children? And um, I must mention your staff as well. You know, um, I think the fact that you so many people depended on you or you mm. were responsible for so many people, uh, there was no time to think for yourself. Right. Um, but you had to be conscious about, um, you know, maintaining the morale of your staff. Yes. Because it was a very difficult situation. Their families had gone, you know. Um, Everything was really uh, difficult. In fact, for days we were holed up in the embassy. The only uh, non-official who stayed behind was my cook. So he used to cook for all of us. <laughs> it was like a picnic uh, and send home, send food to, to the embassy. So the morale of um, the people had to be, uh, you know, kept in but mind. How do you or anyone ensure morale at a time like this? Because you know that there is going to be bombings you know that, uh, you know, there is a chance that you could get uh, hurt. So what did you say? No, to I think everybody went through the same uh, thing, which is that, you know, so much was dependent on each of them. Right. Right. So that is, uh, I think that is a great motivator. Um, they also didn't think about themselves or their comforts. Hmm. And really what I learned was that um, you have to have, you have to really have faith in the individual because when tested by fire every person right. rises to the occasion and this is really something that I discovered during this crisis a person in the normal circumstance may not be uh, that uh, uh, effective or uh, impressive but in a situation like that every man and woman Hmm. And I, I include the local staff too. We had fantastic local staff who were like rock solid. Uh, because there were times when, you know, 30, 20, 20 30 people are breathing down their necks, uh, trying to um, yes. pressurize them to do something. But they were just very calm, doing their work. And yeah. Ma'am, now I want to post -crisis, uh, the crisis, you came back to Delhi. Uh, what was the debriefing you gave our Prime Minister, uh, uh, your assessment of the situation? And number two, I believe you were recognized for your efforts. So could you talk a bit about that? Mm, uh, yeah, the Prime Minister, I got the Prime Minister's Award for uh, Excellence in Public Administration. I feel very humble by it. Um, the debriefing was they wanted to know what happened. So, you know, from A to Z, um, 
how how we organized ourselves mm. with our limited resources we were uh, three officers and two security guards and local staff and uh, later i learned that uh, some other western embassies actually send reinforcements okay. uh, i remember one country uh, uh, send about 80 people to help the embassy you know do the eva- manage the evacuation but we we managed with our minuscule uh, uh, strength. How, many, how much staff w- was with you, ma'am? Mm-hmm. Um, three officers and uh, two security guards and local staff. That's it? And one or two um, good Samaritan local Indians who, okay. who had been there many years and who knew uh, the ropes, who also stood, you know, uh, solidly with us. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah, just going back to one incident you mentioned, you were asking me about some anecdotes that I remember. So I was talking about the Lebanese resilience and mm-hmm. how they never give up. So in the midst of all this darkness, one mm-hmm. day I remember seeing in a newspaper a little advertisement. It was a sunflower and it in a child's scrawl, it said, Lebanon, the sun will shine on Lebanon again and again. Wow. <laughs> so this really lifted my spirit, you know. Mm. That's why I said, you really have to take the cue from them. How mm. to respond to crises and situations. They were just uh, amazing. Finally, ma'am, I just want to ask you. If you were in a, um, I mean, looking back, if an envoy was in such a similar situation, God forbid, what are the things that, you know, you would reflect upon is there anything that you did during that crisis time that you know you perhaps could share in terms of learning is there anything at that time you would have done differently yeah um you know every crisis is different in in nature and uh, terrain and the location is different but i think there are some elements that are common in all um, such crises one is um the suddenness of it things mm. may have been simmering for a long time but when it happens it is sudden and there's no time to think and plan you have to run with it and you have to improvise uh, and innovate and uh, that is one and second wherever it is uh, you know there will be a lot of media glare and uh, maybe partly because of that political pressure uh, to perform or you know to make sure that you're not doing uh, uh, the wrong thing and then uh, in any such situation there's the problem that we face of documentation of um, right. the workers and then you have to coordinate with so many agencies yes you know, stakeholders the ministries uh, the ships the airlines the the embassies around the local uh, authorities uh, all that and then you know You, you had to keep reporting. You have to keep reporting while you're busy with all that uh, evacuation. Uh, information was not always handy. Mm. Everything was unclear. But to the best of um, your ability, you had to keep reporting because that would shape the response of uh, the government. And I am really happy to say that in the case of uh, Lebanon, there was a, um, um, a motion passed by parliament joint houses all party support mm. re- uh, commending the government for its handling of uh, the crisis in lebanon i think that was uh, really um, you know uh, very satisfying and uh, at the end of it all i think what is what was my lesson my my lesson is in these things you can you cannot do remote control um, you have to be there you have to dirty mm. your feet um, and i think it's very important to also have a certain level of empathy for the people you're helping right. without that you'll be you know probably just doing your job and it won't be the same um, and the, and the it it meant a lot to see these people feeling so proud that their country their government cares for them hmm. you know yes. because they were really poor laborers who are otherwise mm, you know right. who don't count for too much in national uh, politics or whatever 
and uh, I think finally, finally, mm -hmm. um, really, uh, you have to have faith in the individual, as I mentioned. This, to me, was the biggest lesson. It was very heartwarming that everybody mm -hmm. stood up to uh, rose to the uh, challenge. Yes. Uh, the locals, the Indians. Mm -hmm. Great. And I think the very, mm -hmm. very proud of the assets we have, like the Indian Navy, right. who arrived there without uh, having being told that this is what they are out to do. They were, this was not part of their brief. Right. But the situation demanded, they came and they were completely ready. They were so professional, you know, right from uh, the time they arrived, they um, helped in checking the papers, they helped women and children up the gangplank, they gave them tea, coffee when they arrived in uh, on the ship, they mm -hmm. made them comfortable. Uh, really humane and professional. So it was. It was really a pleasure to mm. to to work with them. Great. And the Indian Army, mm. which was actually at uh, in part of the UNIFIL, mm. um, they were on the front line of the conflict. They were not part of it, but they were there, and uh, you know, uh, they were solid. In fact, uh, I think the UNIFIL commander, who was a French man. Mm -hmm. asked the Indian uh, Army bat uh, Battalion uh, Brigade Commander whether the Indian um, Army would like to pull out because the situation was so bad, they didn't want to be responsible for it. Um, but the commander said, Indian Army does not run mm -hmm. and we will stay. That's so if Indian Army had run, the whole UNIFIL would have collapsed. That's a... <laughs> Wonderful note to end yeah. on. Ambassador, thank you so much for your time and sharing your thoughts thank with you so us. Much. I'm Ashwin Ahmed. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.